Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2024 Lobby Annual Meeting. I am honored to stand before such an amazing sold-out crowd. As each year, this event brings together legislators, members of the administration, BESI members, and business leaders from across the state like no other event in Louisiana. I want to start off by thanking House Speaker Philip DeVilliers and Senate President Cameron Henry for a terrific morning panel discussion. Let's give them a round of applause. Thanks to both of them for finding time in what's a demanding special session. Um, by now, you've probably noticed the cranes behind me. We believe cranes are a sign of change. They're a sign of progress. Cranes are altering the skylines in cities like Houston, Nashville, and Charlotte as those areas are growing. And we believe Louisiana is next in line. That's why our 48th annual meeting theme this year is Louisiana Rising, Building a Bold New Future. Now, before we kick things off, I'd like to ask Father Jeffrey Bahi to deliver the invocation and Father Charles Swanson to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please come up. You can remain seated. You can remain seated. You can pray sitting down. That's not that hard. <laughs> Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, we come to you as leaders, leaders in our community, leaders in the business world. And we ask you, Lord, to grant us the wisdom and the discernment to do not what is only best for our business, but best for our community. We ask you, Lord, that through our efforts, may our success lead to the success and the empowerment of all the people in our community. So we ask you to watch over and guide us and protect us. And we ask you to bless the food that we receive through your goodness and bless the time that we spend for your honor and glory. All this we pray through our God and Father who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to stand. <laughs> Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, fathers. Would you please give them a round of applause? Now, as you begin your meals, will you please direct your attention to the screens for a special message from our presenting sponsor? Welcome to Lobby's annual meeting. I'm Josh Zumo with Cajun Industries and a member of Lobby's Emerging Leaders. As a longtime supporter of Lobby and its continuous fight for free enterprise, Cajun Industries is proud to once again sponsor this year's annual meeting. This is an exciting time for our state, and that is reflected in today's theme, Louisiana Rising. At Cajun Industries, much of our success has come from our focus on our mission statement. We grow our people to grow our company. We look forward to hearing from Governor Landry today about his focus on our people and growing all Louisiana companies. We welcome all of the newly elected leaders and thank you for joining Cajun and Lobby today. From everyone at Cajun Industries, we hope you too are excited about Louisiana rising. And may God bless you all a safe and prosperous 2024. I want to give a special shout out to our presenting sponsor for the 2024 annual meeting, Cajun Industries. 
I want to express how grateful we are to our friends Todd, Mike, and Lane for their unwavering support of Lobby over the years. We truly appreciate all that you have done and continue to do for our state. Thank you. Now, if you've been coming to this event over the years, you may have noticed we switched things up a little bit uh, to accommodate what's, what's a very busy and tight schedule uh, for our, for our uh, keynote speaker, and we're incredibly excited to have him today. And it's my distinct honor to welcome to the stage our governor, Jeff Landry. Thank you. Good afternoon, or not quite yet, right? <clears throat> uh, look, it was really interesting as we um, drove up. Uh, Sharon was with me. She says, man, it has been just a year ago when we were right here in this very room, and we started to move a message on a campaign that went all the way through to October. <clears throat> I, I would first like to just please ask you all, if you're one of the legislators here, would you please stand up? I'd actually, I, these folks are unbelievable. They really are. They really, really are. You know, because it's been a tough and rocky start. We, we're in our second special session. We're trying not to do any more for the rest of the year um, before we have to get in a regular session, but they really have been great. And they're really starting to find their cadence. <clears throat> I'd also... Um, like y'all, because we're going to change this up just a bit. Uh, you know, when Will called me, and him and I have had a long relationship back when he was at the Louisiana Auto Dealers. Um, great, great relationship. I can't tell you I'm excited uh, about him leading La Vie. Um, you know, he asked, and, you know, as usual, the governor would come up here and give y'all um, a speech. But I thought that we would change it up just a bit because I want that my presence here to be not about me. And that was the same thing we did during the campaign, but about us and about a team. And, and during, right after the election, when we assembled a transition, the transition committees, uh, we had a number of lobby members on that transition committee. Will, um, Eddie, Lane, uh, Dave Roberts, Scott Ballard. Uh, we tried to include as many stakeholders that we could and we made sure that those transition committees were not there just in honorary form or just in a symbol, but to do actual work. And they did. They performed that work. They put out reports. And we intend to heed those reports as we go through the next four years. And so when I was talking to Will, I said, look, I'd rather not just come up here and talk to y'all. But I want to show some action. And so what I would like to do is I'd like to invite up to the stage um, two of, I think, the four secretaries uh, that are here today. Uh, Susie Schoen with the Louisiana Workforce Commission. Susie, would you come up? And Susan Bourgeois, our LED secretary. And of course, I, I want to recognize, I know we have the DEQ secretary, Aurelia Skipworth. And I think Tyler Gray is here somewhere. Oh, there you are, Tyler. Okay, you made it. All right. Well, he's been hard at work. <clears throat> but I tell you, you know, going back, before I get to Susie and Susan, and I'll go out and sit down with them so we can have a discussion, I want to let you know that, again, going back to the transition team, those men and women worked to help us put together what I think is one of the best cabinets that has ever been put together in the state of Louisiana over the last 50 years. You know, starting from Taylor Barra and Patrick Goldsmith at DOA, through these folks. These are men and women who absolutely have the state of Louisiana's best interests in mind. They share the same frustration many of us have over the years as to why Louisiana sits at the bottom rather than in the top. 
And so I'm going to go over and join them because I go, and I really do like it. I really do like, um, Will, this backdrop because not that I'm against the pelican, but I would like that to be the next state bird in the state of Louisiana, right? <laughs> So I'd like to begin with Susie. Hey, Susie and Susan, do y'all understand how difficult my job is? My wife is like, you need to get a name tag, Jeff. <laughs> um, so Susie came to us. Um, she was the vice president of education at the Louisiana Community and Technical College. Um, she spent 10 years at LED. Um, and she understands the direct correlation between educational reform and our workforce. And what I thought we would do for just a, a second, um, and I'm gonna introduce Susan next, is we'll get some questions, have a discussion, so that you all understand what these two ladies are doing that is gonna be so important in helping shape the economic development programs and process processes that we use over the next four years so that at the end of those four years, we can look back and we can see actual metrics and gains where jobs are created and retained. And then we can start seeing that 30,000 number of people that are leaving the state of Louisiana start that number start to go down from a negative um, to a positive. And so Susie, Susie, Help me out. <laughs> Susie's job is to make sure that y'all have a trained workforce out there. Suzanne's job <laughs> is to make sure that we focus on the businesses and industries that grew this state. Because I've always believed that if we focus on you, if we focus on the people that have stuck it out through natural disasters, horrible tax policies, poor infrastructures, that you deserve the government looking at how we can enhance the things that you have built here. And when we do that, I believe that everything else becomes organic. <clears throat> now, Susan, reason we chose Susan, <laughs> well, because I, I think our good transition committee told me that we needed to take Susan. Is that what it was, Lane? <clears throat> um, but she, she has over three decades, I guess three decades? You started in kindergarten, is that what it is? Yeah. Um, in strategic planning and project development. She was also, and I think this is important too, she was the first business executive to, to serve as chairman of GNO Inc. Okay, so this is an actual person who understands business and that businesses must make a profit in order to continue to grow. Uh, and so she, she's going um, to head up. And, and, and she's got a pretty tough job, not that you know. <laughs> but we're going to try to restructure um, the Department of Economic Development. In fact, I, I think I'm going to start with that question. And I'll, I'll start with you, Su Susie. Okay. I, am I skipping? No, I'm coming back to you. I'm coming back. I'm going to go one another. It's just, I got so one of the things that we realized when we, the transition committees met, they realized that other states had found unique ways to organize their Department of Economic Development so that it is streamlined in a way that when businesses want to access important questions or projects and they need the government's help, that they can do so in an efficient and an effective manner. And, and so we, we recognized that we needed to change, not that there were bad people at LED. And so we asked the Committee of 100 uh, to start to work on and give us a couple of proposals on how we should restructure LED. And so why don't you give them a little update? Yeah, so, so from an external perspective, the governor is right. We are working with our partners at, at Committee of 100, and I think I know I saw Adam when I walked in, um, to, to look around the country at the states that are doing this well, the ones that rank at the top of the list, that where we want to be, and look at those structures and, and 
really present to us and present to the governor what works from a structural perspective, but then what you know I love about the governor, what he wants to do is say, let's look at those best practices, but then let's also look at the Louisiana nuances and figure out the absolute best way to do it here. So, so C100 is in the process of doing that research for and with us, um, and you will see legislation drafted in the next few weeks that will begin to implement some of those changes. Um, because at the end of the day, I think we'll all agree that, that we are not doing it well or as best we can when we're the only southern state losing population, when we're the only southern state without an automobile manufacturer, when we have accepted this posture of letting our children decide between home and opportunity. So we don't accept that anymore. Um, and we are aggressively working on both an internal structure at the department, um, an external governance structure of how we do it beyond any one governor, any one administration, to position Louisiana to have all the success we deserve and that we owe our next generations. That's the external conversation. There's an internal conversation, and I won't get too far into the weeds, but there are three really important things that LED um, perhaps has not done well, and we are going to start doing well immediately, regardless of legislation. Number one is that business development and retention is now a proactive decision. We are not a reactive posture anymore. We are interested in, as the governor said, not only chasing new things. Of course, there'll always be new opportunities, but our staff is dedicated to working with the people who have built this state, who have built their companies here, who have built industry, who have built the workforce, and who have committed time and time again to this place. We now, as a department, are committed to you, number one. Num <laughs> number two um, is that intentionally forming relationships and engagement with the private sector so government doesn't have to replicate every bit of expertise is the number two priority for our department right now. Uh, as of March 1st, I will have someone on our team whose sole job it is to form formal relationships with industry and engage you in the appropriate ways within our department to use your expertise, to use your relationships to leverage for our success. And thirdly, um, and everyone who ever talks to me will get really tired of hearing me say this, we as Louisiana and we as a department do a woefully bad job of telling our story. We have so much to offer. Storytelling has got to get better and we have to make sure the world and our citizens know about the opportunity here. So communications and storytelling is our third priority inside the department and all that is happening as we speak. Thank you. And of course, if... Even if Susan does an amazing job, which she will, the ability for her to be successful is predicated on a workforce, right? Which we know right now struggles. Uh, it's one of the reasons that one of the first uh, executive actions we took was to veto Bessie's um, ridiculous uh, proposal to just pass people out of, you know, graduate seniors without a proper reading test. Because if we don't, if, if, if our students are not prepared, irrespective of where they're going after high school, but if they, especially if they're going into the workforce, we would expect, I would expect, that those students show up on your doorsteps with a basic grasp of reading and writing and math. And so, you know, one of the things that Susan and I spoke about when, when we spoke before she got appointed was how to start integrating our students from the high school level into the educational and workforce area so that every vocation, so, so that all education, say it this way, all education actually leads to vocation. So, so why don't you talk about the severity of the workforce shortage we have here? I would be happy to do that. And I really appreciate that Susan went first because I think she really framed the conversation in a terrific way. And uh, the governor mentioned that I come from LED and I am an economic developer and this is the right place for me because workforce development is economic development. If you look at our opportunities to grow as a state, this is where it is. 
our business and industry here that is already established in the state, they're our hottest leads when it comes to economic development and meeting your needs has to be my top priority. So we start with the needs of business and industry in mind. And I'm just going to tell a quick story that one of the very first things that I did as the new secretary was invite Will and Jim and uh, lobby leadership to walk through the front door of the Workforce Commission. We are giving out the message. The LWC is open for business. Every single one of you here is very much welcome to walk in that door and speak with me at any time. But I'm going to give you a few numbers that might help illustrate what kind of crisis we're really looking at here. Right now, our unemployment rate sits at 3.7%. And there's a rule of thumb that anything lower than 4% really represents full employment. And those folks that are unemployed are moving between jobs. But if we look at the last month where we had numbers for the number of unemployed people, it was about 80,000 people. And again, most of them do likely have another job that they're going into very shortly. The number of job openings in Louisiana was 112,000. How are we going to make up the difference? Because the math doesn't work. And the answer to that is another number. So if you look at the unemployment rate, you've got the number of people actively looking for work, and you've got the number of people who are working. If you add those two numbers up, that's your labor force. If you divide it by the adult population, that's your labor force participation rate. In Louisiana, that is less than 60%. That, Wait. That, that is it. It's called the labor participation yes. rate. And that's what we have to fix. That is exactly where the opportunity is. There is so much opportunity there, and it touches every priority that all of us have here. If we can get these folks off the sidelines of our economy and get them into work, meaningful work, we will reduce crime. We will improve educational outcomes. We will improve our educational system by putting parents to work, and it is demonstrated that their children do better in school if you do that. We will see our health outcomes improve. We will see every issue that Louisiana struggles with that impacts our economic development opportunities get better if we can put our people who are here now but not working or under, underemployed into high quality employment. One of the ways that we will need to do that is by better leveraging the systems that are supposed to do that. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But integrated social services on the ground, in the field, and at the state level are going to be an incredibly important priority of mine. And, and, and just to expound on that just a sec, just for a minute, <clears throat> um, before I, I ask both Susan and Su <laughs> Susie and Susan the same question. Let me give you an example. You know, as we were looking through some of the educational reforms uh, that we want to tackle uh, in the regular session, and we were looking at things that work, because there are things in this state that actually are working. Uh, the question is whether we can amplify them. Uh, there was a program that kind of caught my attention uh, that was being uh, used especially for um, poor performing students, but those with um, behavioral problems. And it caught my attention because I was like, well, that's me back when I was in school. And, and when they walked me through the program, the program was very interactive. It required that the kids, it was almost like you were in lab all day long, but they integrated the basics. They integrated science, they integrated math, they integrated reading, all through a very interactive, hands-on approach. And so when, when it was brought to my attention, I asked the fellow who was running it last year, this was in the fall of last year or right after the election, I, I said, could you do me a survey of the kids that you have in the program and tell me what it is that they now want to be? And I, because I can promise you, if, you'd, if you ask them before, they go into the program, they want it to be a TikTok star. You know, or an Instagram hero. 
But what was amazing is after a survey of 500 students, who again, these are not the best in, well, I think they are the best and the brightest, but you would not have recognized them as the best and the brightest because they were poor performing for whatever reason, because we just have not grabbed their attention. And at the end of the survey, these students overwhelmingly, when asking them, what do you want to be now? I want to be a petroleum engineer. I want to work in industrial engineering, project management. It, I mean, spaces under which you would never have guessed this pool of students would be. And I think that that is the opportunity that we have. If we can be innovative in catching the attention of students at a younger age and letting them know that there's more to life than being a TikTok star, then guess what? It helps both of these women do their job. Um, and so quickly, I'll just ask both of y'all the same question, a two-part question. Tell us some of the things that are succeeding, that you've seen succeed in other states and the way that other states have streamlined either economic development or workforce to be successful. Who wants to go first? Susan? I will absolutely go first. And uh, please don't kill me, but I'm going to talk about Texas. The Texas Workforce Commission has some really terrific efforts going on, but what I really want to talk about is their overall approach to systemic reform. And this fall, I went to a meeting in Austin to learn more about what they're doing. They have completely restructured the way that they fund community and technical colleges and K-12. And one of the women working on this effort put it to me like this. She said, we've been spending all our time funding systems and we need to fund people. And that really struck home for me. When we talk about those folks that are not in the workforce right now, those folks are not in the, the workforce for a lot of reasons that we can talk about in broad strokes, but fundamentally for that individual, their problems are individual. We need to be targeting funding and streamlining our, streamlining our efforts in this state so that we are addressing the individual and the needs of the individual. And I have a lot of ideas on how we can do that, which I'm not gonna get into right now. But Texas is doing some really terrific work. There are a number of other states as well that have been really streamlining and coordinating their efforts. Utah is a model that comes up quite a bit. There's a lot of others, and a lot of them are our surrounding states. One of the things that I do want to mention that the Texas Workforce Commission is doing that I'm really excited about is they are providing resources to community members, people like faith leaders and other people who have social capital in their communities to help them take the first steps of career guidance for young people. These are people that these young people are going to trust and are going to see as reliable sources. And these are often the people that are not talking to our young people about the opportunities that so many of you have in fields like the skilled trades and other fields of study that don't require a bachelor's degree. So I think using the community, bringing the community together by giving them resources and information and encouragement to take the lead is going to be a big part of our solution. Susan? Yeah, I think my answer is a lot more simple. Um, maybe I have some lower hanging fruit than Susie does, but at the end of the day, the states that are winning are the ones who actually want to win. And I want to win, right? I mean, the first thing is let's assume a posture that we want to win. That's why we appointed you. <laughs> to win <laughs> right I, I, we want to win and, and any of you obviously in business in this room know when you see your competitor drive get, get to work faster than you or earlier than you you wake up earlier the next morning right so a we want to win b is that um it's been a long time since i've been in state government my, my last time here was with mike foster um and I had forgotten that we have a tendency in government to erect barriers, either by design or default. We erect barriers at every turn to what it is we're saying we actually want to do. And so from a streamlining perspective and what other states are doing, A, they want to win, and B, 
they're making it easy or easier than we are for people to do business in their state. And this is not just a national economy anymore. We all know this. This is a global economy. Every business in this room and every business on this planet gets to decide now where they invest, where they do their work. And we have a, an enormous amount of natural resources that I don't need to explain to any of you in this room. But the fact that states that have one-tenth of what we have are beating us is unconscionable. So we want to win, and we have got to eliminate barriers everywhere to letting you thrive. Okay, now we have a surprise. I'm gonna ask Susie and Susan to join me up at the podium. We don't know about this, by the yeah, way. I don't. And my wife wanted me to remind y'all that the new phrase is that, you know, behind all good women is a man. <laughs> Look, I, one of the things that we have been working real hard on, and we have heard from you all, and this came from the transition committee, and I, and I want you to know that what I am about to do in front of you all is a complete collection of both industry and business stakeholders and local government working together over the last few months from the transition through the inauguration and should signify how we are going to start streamlining things. So in my hand here is a new executive order on the, on the conditions for participation in the industrial tax exemption program. And I want you to know how this is going to work now. There is still going to be an 80-20 split, but we have removed the job requirement because, because this program is about capital investment, okay? It is not about job creating. It is about capital investment. And then the way it's going to work, is that no longer are the applications going to go to multiple local agencies. <laughs> they will go to the local industrial commission, who will have 45 days to take the application and pass it on to the state industrial board. And if, and if there is a difference of opinion between the local industrial board and the state industrial board, the governor will make the decision. How about that? <laughs> so today, we are going to sign this executive order in front of you all, letting you know that it, we will continue to streamline our government and our programs so that they work for you. Thank you. God bless you. Really appreciate it. Will, thank you so very much. Will, I'll leave these up for you. Wow. All right. I hope y'all didn't come just for the chicken. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you, Governor Landry. Thank you for being here with us this morning. I, I know you're heading to an important meeting, and uh, we, we appreciate your time and, and, and your commitment to a better Louisiana. Uh, again, like, like the governor said, I, I served along with many of you on the, on the governor's transition team and helped put together some of these policies. And, you know, what a breath of fresh air that some of those policy recommendations weren't just words on a page. It's nice to see that they are actual take actions and that the governor has put in place talented individuals like Susie and Susan to implement these words, these actions 
uh, in, in a business-friendly environment. And so, uh, again, um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for, for your willingness to serve. I know it's not easy. Um, I worked in, in that agency, uh, uh, Susie, and, and, and so we've talked about that. But, but again, thank you for opening your door back to business and, and for your leadership. Um, now, if you would, please direct your attention to the screen and help me recognize a few additional sponsors who help make this amazing event possible. Good afternoon, I'm Jason DeQueer. And I'm Jimmy Leonard. We are the co-owners of Advantis Consulting. Jason, myself, and the entire team of our 30 state local tax professionals are honored to sponsor this year's annual meeting. As the incoming chair of the 2024 Lobby Board of Directors, I'm excited to work with Will, Lobby staff, Governor Landry, his new administration, and the entire legislature to accomplish the many opportunities we have to make Louisiana a more prosperous state. Here at Advantis, we help our clients navigate the complexities of state and local tax matters, such as sales tax, property tax, income tax, and business incentives throughout the United States. In 2024, we look forward to continuing our partnership with Lobby to foster a climate for economic growth and to promote LA23 to position Louisiana as the economic leader in the South by 2030. We wish everyone here a safe and successful 2024. From natural resource production and farmlands to diverse businesses in cities big and small, Louisiana is a blend of both industry and culture. That's why B1 Bank is proud to call Louisiana home. We founded B1 Bank to serve businesses and their employees in our community. From our headquarters in Louisiana to our banking centers across the state and into Texas, alongside our clients, B1 Bank is growing, both in reach and in impact. We provide businesses with the services and technology they need to streamline day-to-day -day operations, stimulate growth, and prepare for future challenges. Every day, we work with you to create positive economic changes that will expand financial opportunities for generations. The future is coming. Make it uncomplicated. I'm Bill Fontenot, President and CEO of Clico, a Louisiana energy company providing power to 300,000 customers across our great state. Clico is proud to be a member of Lobby and supports its mission to foster a climate for economic growth. Louisiana is the perfect place for businesses to call home. With its certified sites, world-class infrastructure, skilled workforce, as well as state and local incentives, and rich with clean energy solutions. And with our newly elected governor's administration's view on business, Louisiana is poised to become the leader in providing clean energy solutions. And Clico is ready to meet the evolving clean energy needs of our customers with investments in carbon capture and sequestration, solar power, electric vehicle infrastructure, and so much more. Clico is the ideal sustainability partner for companies who are also embracing clean energy solutions. Louisiana is spearheading America's transition to sustainable energy, and Clico is at the forefront. We're working today to energize your tomorrow. Member meeting and morning program sponsor, Dow. Verizon. Refreshment break sponsor, Phillips 66. Lanyard sponsor, Red River Bank. Member and legislature reception sponsor, Air Products, Amazon, AT&T Louisiana, Charter Communications, Chenier Energy, Chevron, Cox Communications, Deloitte, Ed Choice, Endeavor Enterprises, Phyllis M. Taylor, Entergy, Exxon Mobil, Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady Health System, Gulf Coast Bank and Trust, 
International Paper, Latrum LLC, LWCC, Nextera Energy, Oshner Health, Performance Contractors, Turner Industries, Event Sponsors, BASF Corporation, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana, Community Coffee Company, D&J Construction, Fenster Maker, Hancock Whitney, Heirloom Cuisine, Coke Company's Government Affairs LLC, Lockstep Technology Group, Meta, Royal Martin, Sassol, Southwestern Energy, Sparkhound, Thornton, Musso, and Bellamin Incorporated, Warehouser, Program Sponsors, Capital One Bank, Louisiana, JD Bank, Luba Workers Comp, Portis, Hankel, and Johnson, Neely Printing, Please join me in giving a warm round of applause to those sponsors for their support in making this meeting happen. <laughs> Earlier today, we swore in our 2024 100-member Lobby Board of Directors. These are leaders from across the state who will guide Lobby over the next year. I'd like to ask all members of the 2024 Lobby Board of Directors to stand and be recognized for their service. I can say with confidence, there has never been a more exciting, exciting time to be a part of Lobby than right now. You can feel the energy from Main Street to the state capitol. Change is coming and the folks in this room and the leaders who just stood up will help lead the charge towards a more prosperous Louisiana. We can't wait to be a part of it. So to all of our board members, elected officials, lobby members, and to everyone that's in this room today, please join us as we gear up for the next chapter in Louisiana's story. It's critical to have the right leader at the right time. And that's why we are so fortunate at Lobby to have our next chairman as Jason DeQueer, co-owner and partner of Advantis Consulting. And Jason, if you'll come up and join me on the stage, we'd like to honor you and let you say a few remarks. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Will. Uh, last week, Will and I met to talk about this event and uh, we had to do some script planning. And when I was in the office with Will, he pulled out the script and for about an hour, it was Will's script and he said, then Jason, here's your turn. And it was about 10 seconds. And I said, Will, there's no way you can give a lawyer, a microphone and a thousand people and expect me to only talk for 10 seconds. So I'm gonna deviate from the script a little bit. Today, I've got a presentation that's going to last 45 minutes on how we're going to reform our state's tax structure. You okay? I'm just playing, Will. Your chairman has not gone rogue yet. But I am going to go off script a little bit because I do uh, have some thank yous. First, I want to thank my fellow board members uh, for having the confidence and trust in me to lead this next organization uh, for a year. Secondly, I would like to thank all the member companies in this room. Uh, appreciate your time, your contribution, but also have a challenge for you. I'd like for each of you to consider getting more involved with Lobby, joining the committees. Your voice is important. Next, I'd like to thank the outgoing chair. Where is Jude? Is Jude? Jude, stand up. Jude Melville, I will tell you, was the right guy at the right time leading Lobby last year. Please. We didn't know our CEO was going to resign. We knew there were going to be elections. We knew there'd be a new governor. And we had to go out and find a new president. And Jude, you had unwavering mentality, led us, 
got us a new CEO, and uh, thank you for all your time and effort. I also really appreciate you putting the extra 30 meetings on the books for the next incoming chairman, so thank you so much for that. Next, Jim Patterson. Where is Jim? Y'all all know Jim Patterson. I don't know if he's in here. But this wouldn't have been possible either without Jim. During the time our CEO stepped down and replacing, Jim stepped in and was the interim CEO. If you don't know Jim, uh, you should. He's kind of the resident historian. I think he's been at Lobby since before I was born. But uh, wherever you are, Jim, let's give Jim Patterson a round of applause. Next, I'd like to thank the members of the Executive Search Committee. If you were on the Search Committee, I'd like for you to stand up, please. I want to just say thank you for all of your hard work, dedication, and helping us to find a new leader at Lobby. But most importantly, I wanted you to stand up because if Will doesn't live up to the hype, I want to know who everybody in this room can blame. So. But last and certainly not least, I wouldn't be able to do this without my family and my Advantis family. So Advantis family, please stand up if y'all are over there. I know you've got some spread out. Thank you. We would have had the whole firm in here, but Will's prices for tables were way too expensive. But I could not do it without them uh, giving me the time, flexibility, covering my back when I'm not at the office. And obviously, after consulting with Jude, I realize it's going to be a lot more time, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to. And then lastly, I'd just like to end with echoing the comments that we heard here today. Uh, this is an exciting time. Uh, people asked uh, the last several weeks, Jason, you know, what would you or how would you like to be remembered? as the lobby chairman for the year. And of course, you think about all of the routine things. We want to increase memberships. We want the financials to be strong. We want to be a vibrant organization. And all of those things I know we will accomplish. But right now, we have a unique and real opportunity to get some things done. I know y'all are familiar with the LA 23 report. I had an opportunity to work on that. I'm just excited to see that a lot of the goals that are in LA 23 are aligned with the governor. And I think this is a real opportunity to get some things done, begin to move Louisiana off the list of last, and really make this a state that everybody in the country can be proud of. And uh, lastly, uh, I'll just say, as I end all of my meetings at Advantis, let's go fight win. Thank you, Jason. And um, again, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate Jude and Jason. Um, it, it is... Uh, Again, we need the right leaders at the right time, and, and, and I know I'm preaching to the choir if you're in this room. Um, at this time, I would, um, speaking of leaders and the right people at the right time, I would like to recognize all of our statewide elected officials and legislators in the audience uh, who have joined us today, as well as members of the Supreme Court, Public Service Commission, the Board of Second, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education, members of the governor's executive staff and other dignitaries. I, uh, my team tells me they have done a no man's work of getting everybody that's here, but if I miss somebody, shout it out. Um, Representative Beryl Amity, Representative, and then uh, if you would, just hold your applause to the end. I'm gonna ask everybody to stand and then uh, be recognized and then hold your applause um, till the end. Uh, Representative Beryl Amity, uh, Representative Larry Bagley, Representative Dennis Bamberg, Representative Stephanie Brawl, Representative Emily Chenevere, Representative Kim Coates, Representative Raymond Cruz, Representative Philip DeVilliers, Representative Jason DeWitt, Representative Keeley Dickerson, Representative Michael Eccles, Representative Kathy Edmonston, Representative Peter Egan, Representative Julie Emerson, Representative Gabe Ferment, 
Representative Barbara Freiberg, Representative Jay Galley, Representative Brett Guyman, Representative Brian Glorioso, Representative Kyle Green, Representative Troy Abair, Representative Jason Hughes, Representative Big John Ilg, Representative Jacob Landry, Representative Wayne McMahon, Representative Dixon McMakin, Representative Michael Mellerin, Representative Joe Orgeron, Representative Chuck Owen, Representative Troy Romero, Representative Lori Schlegel, Representative Roger Wilder, Senator Mark Abraham, Senator Robert Alam, Senator Stuart Cathy, Senator Heather Cloud, Senator John Paul Cousin, Senator Cameron Henry, Senator Bob Henskins, Senator Caleb Kleinpeter, Senator Patrick McMath, Senator Greg Miller, Senator Beth Mizell, Senator Alan Seaball, Senator Jeremy Stein, Senator Kirk Talbot, Senator Glenn Walmack, and then we've got Secretary Richard Nelson, Secretary Aurelia Giacometto, Secretary Susie Schoen, Secretary Susan Bourgeois. Uh, we've got Insurance Commissioner Tim Temple, who you'll hear from in a little while. We've got BSE President Ronnie Morris, BSE Member Stacy Mellerin, Lafouche Parish President Archie Chasson, uh, EBR Metro Council Member Rowdy Godet, Education Superintendent, Superintendent Dr. Cade Brumley, and I believe we've got, uh, uh, is, is, Brian, is Brian Wilson? Uh, we've got uh, Chairman Daryl Desitel. You arrive late, you get chairman in front of your name. Um, we've got, uh, is, that, is that the Attorney General? Who is that? Attorney General Liz Mural. Can't forget her. Chief Legal Officer, is that, I don't, who, who am I looking at down there? Is that Tom, Thomas Presley, Senator Thomas Presley. Um, who am I, who, who else? Who, who am I looking at? Bo, Bo Ye texted me, said he was running late, forgot. Senator Royce Duplessis, the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> yell, yell out names. Yell. Oh, Mr. Chairman Franklin Foyle. Josh, uh, Representative Carlson, Josh Carlson. This is, committees just must have just got out. I, I'm, 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 I'm dying here. If you're, uh, who else is in the room? This is, this is chaos. <laughs> um, Secretary of DNR, Tyler Gray, and a big round of applause. I'm sorry if I missed anybody. I'm so sorry. Um, um, that, look. Right people, right place, right time. As I, I, this is not a line. As I go around the state, you, you know, I'm, I'm from God's country up in North Louisiana. Don't tell anybody. Yeah, that's, here we go. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Don't tell anybody this. I'm originally from Bernice, Louisiana. Not many people know, what, know where that is. It's a suburb of Ruston. Um, but I drive up and I, go, and I drive around through Main Street and there's, I, I kid you not, there's never been an energy like there is now, and, and a lot of it is because of the people that just stood up. I mean, take ownership of that. Uh, you know, there's, look, things like this, the governor just did today. I mean, I talk to businesses all the time. I talked to a colleague that's in Texas right now, and he said, never before have we talked about Louisiana doing things better and Texas being scared of Louisiana, but it's because of things like this, and it's because of things like what you're doing. And so thank you for that, and thanks for taking, taking ownership of that. You know, how, how many times is Texas talking about what we're doing, right? And so that's what we're talking about. That's what Secretary Bourgeois is talking about, getting out ahead. Um, so uh, speaking of getting out ahead, uh, I'd like to introduce our next video and tease the next phases of a little project we have. One year ago in this very room, Lobby launched a bold effort to map out Louisiana's path to economic prosperity. The path to a better future for our children 
our communities, and our quality of life. The path to simplify doing business in Louisiana, to bring more jobs and opportunity here, and to make sure our citizens are educated, trained, and ready to seize that opportunity. Lobby's LA23 Roadmap was the starting point on a journey to our ultimate destination. Louisiana as the South's economic driver. 2023 was indeed a year of change and the start of something new. Lobby led the effort and Louisiana voters elected the most pro-business legislature in recent history. They elected a new governor, statewide officials, and new education leaders with bold ideas geared up for change. They too voted to reject the status quo and chart a new course for Louisiana. Now it's time to take the wheel. The foundation at the Capitol is set. We have the roadmap. Let's follow that map at full speed. The plan that was LA 23 is now the movement we call LA Driven. Join us as we drive Louisiana in a better direction, driven to improve, driven to compete, driven to prosper, driven to win. All right. So who's ready to take the wheel? Who's ready to succeed? Who's ready to make Louisiana the economic driver, the economic leader across the South? If you are, then stay tuned for the next steps and pay attention at lobby.org. At Lobby, we're known for our robust policy goals, special events like this, programming for our members across the state, and world-class storytelling through our podcast and Fifth and Main magazine. In all the work we do, LA Driven will continue to be our roadmap to ensure we stay the course. Speaking of, one of the top to-dos on our LA Driven agenda is tackling our insurance crisis. With that in mind, we are bringing up our next guest, who is now tasked with one of the most pressing issues facing the members of our state. So please join me in welcoming Louisiana's Insurance Commissioner, Tim Temple. Good afternoon. I'll tell you, for those of you that know me, I first started running for this office. The seed was planted back in 2017. And still to this day, whenever I hear a commissioner, you know, I kind of think, where's Mike Strain? <laughs> it's kind of taking to get a little used to there. Um, look, I, I'm, I'm excited to be uh, your commissioner of insurance. And, and as, as Will said, yes, it is, it, it's a tackle. It's a project. You all live it. You all know it. You're dealing with it either in your lives, as individuals, family, households, or your businesses. You know, and as, as we heard our panel up here talking about with, with Susie and Susan, you know, talking about their jobs and helping drive economic growth, I want you to know that I'm looking forward to the partnership with them. Um, a lot of you may not know this, but uh, uh, Susan was on a trip with us to London last year in December. She didn't know it, it was a job interview at the time. But uh, I want to let you know that she did a great job. She understands the economic challenges that you as businesses face as it relates to insurance, and she played a, a key role and helping conversations we had with insurance and reinsurance companies. So let me just, a brief rundown on where we are and what we're doing. And many of you already know this. Louisiana is the most unaffordable state in America for insurance. That means we spend more of our hard earned dollars on insurance than any other state. Those of you trying to recruit people to come to Louisiana and work in Louisiana, you're facing the challenge of telling somebody, move to our state, and your auto insurance doubles. Move to our state, and your homeowner's insurance is going to triple. I mean, those are challenges that are insurmountable right now. You know, you've got your economies, you've got your finances you've got to deal with, but you can't just say, come here, and oh, by the way, we're going to offset that cost. And so I want you to know that the Department of Insurance, we, we understand the importance that that unaffordability plays 
and, and your success as a business. And, and like I said, we're working, you know, looking forward to working with Susan and, and with Susie to help bring about some change there. October, I guess October, let me start back. August 2020, Hurricane Laura. And then shortly after, Delta, Zeta, ending in Ida. Four hurricanes, two of the strongest ever recorded in Louisiana, 12 month, two day period. 800,000 property claims. $23 billion paid or reserved on a book of business that, that collected $2 billion. For the CFOs in the company, you know what that means. You know, you collect two and you pay out 23. The market's upside down right now. But fortunately for many of you in here, in this room and around the state, the insurance companies you were with did the right thing. They had the right financial reserves. They had the proper levels of reinsurance purchased and they survived that. But for a lot, they didn't. We had 12 companies go insolvent. Over 100,000 claims have now gone from the standard market to Louisiana citizens, the market of last resort, the one that you and I all own together as citizens. So there's a bit of a challenge there on the homeowner's side. You know, in addition to that, we've got a, a commercial trucking crisis that many of you have been dealing with for years. You know, as I travel the state, yeah, you know, the, the horror stories that you hear of, you know, the logging industry, for example, they get quotes of $25,000 per unit from only one insurer that's willing to write the risk. You know, the men and women that operate those, they, they can't drive those, those vehicles long enough, fast enough, you know, hard enough to make money to pay for the insurance, much less maintenance, fuel, employee cost, trying to put a little bit back for their business and themselves. It's, it's, it's strangling the, the economy in our state. And that's just the logging industry. It applies to, to any and every business that drives a truck. Yesterday I was in Lake Charles talking to the Louisiana Port Association. I know a few of you are in here today, so if I say some things, just eat your dessert. Um, you know, but, but it is. Any vehicle that rolls that, that's owned by a business is commercial auto. And it, it's, it's strangling the, you know, the economy there too. And so again, I just want you to know that the Department of Insurance, we understand the challenges that you face from an economic standpoint and we're working hard every day. So what do we do? Well, let's agree on a couple of basic facts, if you will. One, insurance is a promise to pay. And insurance companies are in the business of paying claims. Two, litigation should never be a substitution for the claims process. And in Louisiana, <laughs> and in Louisiana, that's what it's become. You know, three companies, just like every company in this room, insurance companies, they don't have to do business in Louisiana. They decide to do business in Louisiana. They decide where they want to take their stockholder investment or their individual investors' money and deploy it. And right now in Louisiana, it's a tough place to, to make that argument that they want to do business in Louisiana. And there's a couple of factors for that that we'll get into. And at the, the, the fourth, and the governor set it up here about business. Businesses have to make a profit. And in, in insurance, they have to make a profit too. The ones that don't, go insolvent. And so we've got to make sure that we create a stable environment where companies have a fair chance to make a fair profit. Not excessive, but a fair chance. And right now, that's, that's the challenge that we have in Louisiana. So with that in mind, let's talk about why Louisiana's had a hard time attracting, right? We experienced a high level of catastrophic events in Louisiana. South Louisiana, like I said, we've had hurricane after hurricane for over a 12 month period. North Louisiana, hailstorms, you know, even Lake Charles after Laura, they had a flood and a freeze. So Louisiana does have more than its, its you know, uh, its fair share of that. We also have a poor regulatory environment as compared to our neighboring states. And I'll give you an example. Prior to January 8th, if you are an insurance entity, someone that's regulated by the department, an adjuster, uh, an agent, a broker, if you call the Department of Insurance and you ask how the department was to interpret a regulatory, you know, a, a regulation that we have to follow, 
you were told, we can't tell you. Go hire an attorney, go hire a lobbyist, figure it out, operate the way you think it is, and we'll let you know if it's right or wrong. It's punitive. It's not the way that business should operate. It's not the way that a regulatory environment should operate. So January 9th, when you call and you ask how the department interprets a regulation, we're going to tell you how we're going to interpret a regulation. We're not going to give you legal advice, but we're going to tell you how we're, how we're going to hold you, to what level we're going to hold you accountable. We're trying to create that uh, stable you know, environment there. Legal. You heard me say it earlier. You know, litigation should never be a substitution for handling, a, you know, the, the regular process of handling a claim, adjusting a claim. And we're going to bring legislation. And we're working with, with some good members here in the, uh, in the House and the Senate. Uh, and I've had some conversations with the governor. I was very honored to be co-chair of his insurance crisis task force. We came up with some good solutions. Uh, we were just a, 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 a task force that uh, Chairman Talbot chairs uh, with regards to auto insurance. We're going to, some of those, we're going to adopt those. We're going to bring some legislation to address that. You know, like I said, on the regulatory side, and I've got to apologize. Normally I just riff, and I've got a great group of people I work with, and they wrote a couple of things that I said, they said I need to mention here. So we're going to allow insurers, like other businesses, to change their prices as needed instead of once a year. We were the only state that allowed, that, that held companies to that standard. We're going to introduce uh, legislation to reform the three-year rule which makes Louisiana the only market on the planet that doesn't allow an insurance company to make changes to ensure that they are effectively managing their risk. We're the only environment, the only regulatory authority on the planet that tells a company, once you've done business with somebody for three years, you have to keep doing business with them. It's just, it, it, that is not free market, and it, and it seriously inhibits companies from wanting to come and do business in the state. We're going to move from prior approval of rates to file and use, which has helped speed to market. We'll provide more resources or more helpful response to industry and consumers about how we interpret the, the laws and regulations, which I mentioned. We're going to allow insurers to self-report and address minor market conduct violations right now. It's everything is just heavy handed, uh, you know, as I say, right now, prior to January 8th, you know, everybody, it, was a, it was a hammer looking for a nail. We're gonna change that. Um, and then just a few other things. Uh, we're gonna clarify the additional living order. Some of you may have been uh, impacted by that after Ida. We're gonna get rid of profit caps. The department had an, in, an internal uh, desk rule that told insurance companies how much money they could make. Not you, the consumer but the commissioner, that's not free market. That's not how that should work. So we're gonna, we're actively uh, engaged in some of those internals. Some of those we're gonna have to do through legislation. The fortified roof program, I think many of you have heard that, you know, as, as, as you know, our population is, is lives close to the coast. We've got a working coast. Most of our population is on I-10 or south of I-10, which means most of our insured properties or on I-10 or south of I-10, exposed to hurricane winds. The Fortified Roof Program is designed to help mitigate against hurricane, future hurricane damages. If we're going to live close and we're going to build close, we need to make sure that the properties there, the properties that are built, are able to withstand hurricanes as they come in, or better withstand hurricanes. And so the Fortified Roof Program, we're going to continue to ask for funding for that, but we're also going to ask that building codes be improved so that the people that do build and live along the coast are, are better situated to, for their home to be there after a storm, for their roof to stay on, their contents to stay dry. That helps the claim be a, a lower amount at the end of the day, but it also helps that person get back in their home and that community get back up and running faster. We've got a list of, uh, again, some, some legislators, legislation that we wanted to, you know, that we want to work on, but I think I've mentioned most of, this, most of those. Um, you know, I can just tell you that I am excited about the opportunity. You know, I know, you know, I'm looking forward to working with our governor. We've got the, I was speaking to somebody earlier today and, and I'm gonna use the word that they said. We've got the right people in the right seats on the bus. You know, we've got a governor that's gonna help with, with 
the reform as regards to abuse of the legal system. Uh, Y'all heard from our, our legislative leaders earlier today. You know, I think their, their head and their hearts and their minds are in the right spot on how to support insurance reform. We've got a whole group of new legislators in addition to returning legislators that everybody was elected on insurance reform, whether they admit it or not. You know, it's the number one item in this state. Um, we've got Susan, we've got Susie. You know, like I said, I'm looking forward to that. I'm, Will and I have had conversations at the, at, at the le level with lobby and other associations to working on insurance reform package. And from what I'm told, it's the first time in several years that you've got all of these stakeholders sitting in the same room, agreeing on most of the things that need to be done. And so maybe I'm just a little optimistic or maybe too optimistic that we're gonna get a lot of good things done, but, but I'm excited and, and I think you need to be too. And I'm gonna ask you, reach out to the men and women here that you elected. Tell them that you want and expect insurance reform. We're gonna bring some packages and look, if it doesn't work, blame me. You know, don't blame the men and women that vote on the legislation that I ask you to support. Blame me, but we're going to bring it. But we need their votes. We need their support. And we're going to ask the legislative leadership to make sure that we try and get these things introduced early in the session. March 11th is fast, but just for those of you that will get a little wonky here, but for those of you not familiar with the insurance and the reinsurance world on the property market, most of the reinsurance renewals are coming up in London and Bermuda and elsewhere around the globe, June and July 1st. If we do what needs to be done, if we make the reforms that they're looking, for, they're looking, they're watching to see if we're doing, if we're paying attention and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, if we make those changes, I think that what you'll see is that companies that go, and Louisiana Citizens is a good example, they're in the reinsurance market right now. If we can make these changes early in the legislative process, those reinsurance companies will factor that into their rates. I'm not gonna tell you that your rates are gonna go down. So you're not gonna get that quote. <laughs> but what we're trying to do is moderate the increase. And once we can moderate the increase and start to get it level and these companies start to come back in, that's when that availability will drive the affordability number down. And that's what we want, and that's what we need, and that's what I'm asking you for is please encourage everybody you know that pushes a button, yes or no, to help support insurance reform. So I think I was the last speaker. I know uh, Will said he's buying drinks for everybody at the bar. Thank you all very much. And, and look, I. I I want to emphasize this. It's nothing the commissioner just said is is reinventing the wheel. I mean, these are, I, 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 I told him yesterday when we spoke, I, I, I um, use this line all the time. I take creative licensing of, of a line he uses all the time is, is that, you know, we are, we can't control the weather, but we can control how we react to the weather. And, you know, look at states like Florida. They have the same challenges we do but we don't react the same way they have. And so while carriers aren't fleeing the state like they are in Florida, because they've done some of the changes that exactly the same changes the commissioner talk, is talking about, carriers are there, they're riding, and competition creates a driving down of rates. And so that's what the commissioner's talking about. He's not reinventing the wheel. We're not making things up. We're not going and, you know, with crayons and, and you know, writing new things. These are things that other states have done. And these are, these, are, these are things with proven results. And so thank you, Commissioner, for your leadership there. Again, same theme that we've been talking about, background in insurance. He's run businesses. He's paid premiums. He's not a lifelong politician. He's been there, he's done it, and he knows what it takes to get results. And that's why we're excited to have him leading the state. So thank you, Commissioner, again. And I want to thank all of you and all our legislators, including Representative Danny McCormick, uh, Representative Jacob Broad, uh, Senator Adam Bass, that's a big man. I don't want to uh, upset him. Um, and then including our leaders that we have here today. Thank you, Kyle Ardwine. Thank you for, for everything you've done. Thank you, Kyle Ruckert. Uh, thank you. I haven't seen Andre Miller, but, but thank you, Andre, uh, for your leadership and in, in, inside the administration. And thank you all for being here. Um, so uh, a sincere thank you to everyone for joining us and supporting Lobby's mission. We truly appreciate all that you do 
to make Louisiana an awesome place to live and work. 2024 is gonna be monumental. And we need everyone in this room, as the commissioner said, to use their voice. Go back into your communities. You're from all across the state. Go back into your communities and use your voice. Use your influence. Stay plugged in as we usher in a bold new Louisiana. Thank you and God bless.